our proceedings some uh, place after this 30-minute uh, um, break. Council, shall we continue the hearing with the witness? Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, welcome back, Mr. Suare. Uh, I remind you that you're still under oath. Uh, are you able to proceed now? Yes, sir. Uh, before the break, uh, we were talking about the general security situation in the country. Uh, you talked about the disgruntlement in the army. You talked about the two mutinies or demonstrations uh, by the soldiers from, from Yundom Barracks over allowances or unpaid allowances. Uh, and we also talked about the, perce the perception uh, regarding the government of the day, corruption that was ongoing and so forth. So uh, can you tell us about the events of uh, 24th July 1994? Do you recall where you were on this date? The 21st of July, 1994, was a normal day. We were expecting the president return, returning from uh, the UK and uh, we pr the TSG was tasked to perform security duties at the airport as well as uh, on some of the junct main junctions from uh, the airport to Banjo. Was that normal? That was normal, but that was in the morning, that was what we planned and everything, the normal planning. But, but at some point, I was called by the then commander of the TSG, who happens to be Journey. What was his rank at the time? Uh, uh, he was his uh, chief superintendent, yes, equivalent Karel. to the rank of commander. That uh, they have information that uh, the army, some elements of the army, uh, preparing to stage a coup at the airport. Did he identify which elements of the army were involved in that? No, sir. And uh, as a result of that information, did he issue any orders? Yes, sir. Kindly tell us, please, and in detail. Well, <clears throat> the orders were to be prepared not as usual, but more heavily. We use all our heavy equipment that we have, that is the LMGs and uh, more AK-47s and two magazines. Normally, we, we just go with uh, one magazine. And we secure the airport with more elements than, than usual. What is a magazine? A magazine is uh, the pouch where uh, ammunitions are stuck. And for the types of rifles you had, AK-47, how many uh, bullets would be contained in that pouch? Uh, in a magazine, you have uh, 30, 30 rounds, 30 bullets. That means to say you carried 60 rounds each? Yes, sir. And uh, how were you organized? Well, uh, at the airport, we secured uh, the tarmac as well as uh, the arrival. I can say the whole airport was secured because we had enough men for it. And uh, on the road, 
we put up some elements armed, which is not normal. It in, was not what, norm in what posture? Well, we have uh, some conceal, defensive conceal uh, elements in the in the bushes and on top of the buildings at the airport. You were prepared for battle? Yes, sir. What happened at the airport eventually? Eventually, when uh, the Guard of Honor assembled, that the Guard of Honor is uh, done by the Army. When they assembled, we saw some elements of the Nigerian Army. The Nigerian Army, they came in and uh, they, they disarmed the military police. Because as at the airport, when we go on such duties, only the military police is armed on the army side. The orders, the, the guard of honor, they have arms without ammunition. It is just for uh, ceremonial. But they strip they strip the weapons. They look at the magazines on the weapons. If they are, uh, if they they have bullets on the chambers, they. Uh, Mr. Suarez, uh, let's take it step by step. Uh, you had several groups at the airport. Uh, you had the guard of honor. That's one element. You also had military police. That's another element. Uh, you said it was only military police that, were, that would normally be armed. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Uh, what happened to the military police? Uh, the military police, they have been disarmed by the Nigerians. Uh, who was the commander of the military police on that occasion? It was uh, Lieutenant Yajame. Can you explain further what you mean by disarming? <clears throat> because the military police, they used to have each side, a side pistol. And those pistols were taken away from them. And what happened to the Guard of Honor? The Guard of Honor, they stripped their weapons. That is, uh, they, pull out the magazine, they pull out the magazines check if there's any round or not, and they open the chambers of the weapons to see if there's any round in the chamber to make sure that the, uh, the weapons were empty. And uh, was such intrusive measures extended to the members of the TSG who were present? No, sir. How were these activities perceived by members of the army who were present at that time? It was very humiliating. Were other people present when this was happening? Yes, the normal, uh, uh, how, how do you call it again? The normal welcoming committee was there and even some were laughing. How was that received by members of the army? It was aggravated. It was aggravating. Because uh, even uh, the member of the TSG felt it. Because we have what we call uh, esprit de corps. What did you feel exactly? Tell us. I felt very humiliated because uh, it was not proper. That should have been done at the barracks, not in face of the uh, in the civilians. Because, uh, well, there is a mentality, military mentality, which you know they do not disregard civilians as such, but 
they have their own ways of doing things. So you suggesting that what was done was improper and it was not well received by those who were directly affected? Yes, sir. Did President Jawara eventually arrive? Yes, he arrived and he took the guard of honor and went home. Were there other unusual uh, events uh, that day? No. On that particular occasion, who was the head of the welcoming party? Of the group that welcomed the president, who was the head? I believe it was the vice president, then, Sheikh Hussarabali. Were you at the airport? Yes, sir. Was Mr. Sabali present? Yes, sir. That's your recollection? Uh, my recollection, yes, sir. And uh, after the president arrived, what happened next? Uh, when he arrived, he took the guard of honor and uh, he was hosted in his vehicle and uh, his, his uh, escort and they went back to, they went to Banyol. What would you say to the suggestion that uh, Mr. Sabali was not present at the airport? Those are my recollection because I cannot uh, understand the vice president being, he, being in town and the president coming and for him not to be present at the airport. So, so for you, the vice president should be present at the airport on that day and you base uh, your view that he was present simply uh, on the protocol that the vice president must necessarily be there. Yes, we are talking of over 23 years ago. Of course, I understand there can be lapses of memory. I just want to establish uh, the basis of your answer that uh, you believe the vice president was there simply because he ought to have been there. Is that right? Yes, sir. And uh, you, you don't necessarily recall whether he was present or not? No, sir. So uh, now the president has arrived. The army went through that humiliation, as you call it, and uh, the president left for, for, for state house. What else happened for the rest of that day? Well, uh, we went back to the barracks, back and went home, and uh, the information I got later, that is, uh, when everything passed, is that uh, the army, Yaya, and the others at night they regroup at the uh, at the at the Union barracks. Uh, do you know whether those officers who were disarmed at the airport were arrested on that day? No one was arrested. That was one of the first mistakes. Do you know whether the rumor or the information that filtered through from Mr. Jaune, did it implicate any particular unit within the army? No, sir. I don't have that information. So the only unit that was dealt with was the military police because they would be the only unit that would be armed when the president arrived? Yes, sir. And your view is that the manner in which it was done was humiliating, not just to those directly involved, but also to the members of the TSG who were present? Yes, sir. Who started telling us that you later received information that at night Yaya Jame, who was the leader of the military police, they started to regroup at Union Barracks. That's what you just told us, correct? Yes, sir. Do you continue your narration from that? Well, 
Well, as I said, this information that I received is not on the day. It was days later that I knew what happened. Okay, days you subsequently late. learned. Learned, yeah, I learned. Tell us what happened that night and the following morning. The day the president arrived, you, he was received, he went home, you went, returned to barracks. Did anything of significance happen that night? No, sir. I went home as usual, and uh, in the morning I went to work as usual, 7.30, I was at the Fajara, I was at the barracks. Was it normal or was it commonplace to, ha to receive such information about a coup about to happen or a coup happening? Uh, it was almost a routine. Because uh, then the NSS, every time we have rumors of coup, rumors of coup, or invasion from, uh, from Kukoi and his groups. Did the frequency of these rumors uh, have anything to do, or did it impact how you eventually viewed this, this intelligence? Yes, sir. Can you kindly the, tell us? At the end of the day, uh, at, at the end of the day, uh, the NSS was not to be trusted with information because uh, we thought that sometimes they will just want to be on the limelight lime and uh, bring bring false information. By 1994, were you taking this intelligence seriously? No, sir. How about your superiors in the TSG? Were they taking it seriously? Well, when they received the information, they filtered it down to us, and we take action. And if we take action and nothing happens, well, that has an implication on the moral of the man, too. And on July 22nd, 1994, you went to work in the morning. What happened after that? <coughs> well, I was called by my commander, happened to be through Jaune, for briefing. And uh, at that time, I heard the, the bigula calling for falling, when, uh, which is not normal. It means an alarm. So he told me that uh, the army, some elements of the army again are staging a coup and they are going towards Banjul that I should uh, close the bridge and with, uh, my, uh, with my elements and shoot at sight any military personnel that I see coming towards Banjul. Did you take that order? Did you accept that order from him? Well, in his office, I accepted the order. But on the ground, I used my initiative. Before we get to that, in your conversation with your, your superior, Mr. Jaune, uh, did you say anything to him? after you received those orders? Yes. I asked him the, uh, the, uh, the, the, inf uh, the veracity of the information that uh, they are staging a coup. As I told him yesterday, it was the same thing. Last night, it was the same thing. They are staging a coup, nothing happened, and no one was uh, arrested. <laughs> Is this a serious thing? He said, yeah, it's serious. I said, okay. What, uh, what did you do as a result of the order he gave you? Go, go and take the bridge, close the bridge, and shoot at on site any military officer who approaches. What did you do as a result of that order? Well, when I arrived at the bridge uh, with my men, I went with uh, the Delta Company 
Before your arrival, tell us exactly what you did to prepare your men to go to the bridge. Well, uh, as usual, I ordered the Amore to open the Amore and uh, uh, gave the weapons to the elements, and they were given uh, AK-47, uh, one AK-47, AK and uh, two, two magazines. That's the most we can do. Two magazines, that's 60 rounds. Uh, and we had one LMG, that is a light machine gun, with the hundred rounds. How many troops did you? Ha how many soldiers did you have with you? Well, when I moving at the bridge, I had uh, the Delta Company, which was comprised almost of thirty-three people, plus a platoon, which was uh, uh, commanded by Lieutenant Beneminte, that was supposed to be a mobile. A, a, a mobile platoon. Uh, who deputized Lieutenant Bineminte with for that platoon? Uh, it was Lieutenant late Lieutenant Jaju. Do you remember his full name? If you don't, it's okay. We can proceed. No. <laughs> Would it be Lamin Jaju? Yes. And uh, who were the other officers with, you, with your group? Well, I had uh, WOT2 Martin, now general. What's his full name? Alaji. WOT2 Alaji Martin. Yes, sir. And, and who uh, else? I can recall Ka Kopunbai. I don't remember his first name. And uh, you had a company comprised of 33 men, Delta Company, as you said. And then you had a platoon commanded by uh, uh, Bine Mister, Lieutenant Bineminte at the time. Uh, what was the size of that platoon? Uh, the platoon was about 15 men. So. Would it be correct to say that you had about uh, 48 men with you? Correct. They were all armed with AK-47s, two magazines, and you had a light machine gun with about 100 rounds, correct? Correct, and uh, I had a side pistol too with eight rounds. Do you recall... Uh, the time you arrived at the bridge? Yes, we arrived at the bridge as, as after eight, before nine. In the morning or in the afternoon? In the morning. Evening, oh, sorry. Morning or evening, you said morning, okay. So um, on your way from Fajara to the bridge, uh, did you encounter any soldiers? No, we did not encounter any soldiers. It is at the bridge when uh, I assembled my men to brief them because they had a briefing at the Fajara barracks. And uh, on the ground, I had to brief them again. What, what did you say to them? Well, to put it bluntly, I tell you that I told them that at this juncture, I am between you and God. Your life depends on me, and my life depends on you. So you receive orders in the barracks that to shoot at sight. My last order is don't shoot anybody until and unless I give you the orders. By doing that, would you agree that you modified the orders you received from your superior officer? I would say yes. Having modified or changed the orders you received from your superior officer, uh, was there any opposition to the new orders you have given to your men? Only one chap wanted to get out of the ranks because I've asked anyone who do not agree with my orders, let him fall out from the, 
from the group. But uh, he was held back by Kopun Mai. I can remember that. Um, do you recall the name of that uh, TSG officer? No, sir. Uh, would it be the role, what is the normal role of corporals in a platoon? No, uh, the corporals, they are in charge of sections in the, plat uh, in the platoon. They are in charge of sections. And sections is composed of uh, between uh, eight and nine men. Would their role involve enforcing discipline among members of the section? Of course. And uh, when Corporal Mbai pulled back this soldier, this TSG officer, and put him back in line, he was basically enforcing discipline within the ranks, accept the order of the commander, correct? Yes, sir. So now your men have accepted the modified orders that they have now received from you. What happened next? Then I deploy them. Uh, the deployment, uh, it means uh, they took positions, fighting positions, concealed orders somewhere behind the police station or on the left-hand side of the road, the others on the right-hand side of the road. They concealed, they concealed themselves on uh, almost uh, uh, a U-shape, a horseshoe. Uh, what or which ends of the bridge did you occupy? I occupied the combo side before from Combo before getting onto the bridge by the police station there. Did you also deploy men at the Banjul end of the bridge? Yes, sir. So this means to say that you, and you controlled the bridge entirely, both at Banjul end and at Combo end. Is that right? Yes, sir. Did you receive other orders as to how to respond from any superior officer other than Mr. Jaune? Yes, sir. Could you tell us about it? Well, I received the same orders uh, that Jaune gave me from uh, AIG Chongan. And uh, at one time, I received the same orders uh, from uh, uh, the IGP, who was uh, Pasalajai through the police communication radio. You received, let me just get this correct. You received orders from Mr. T uh, from Turo Jaune, shoot at sight any military officer who tries to cross the bridge. Is that right? Yes, sir. You received orders from Chongan, Ibrahim Chongan, shoot at sight any military officer who tries to cross the bridge, correct? Yes, sir. You received orders from Pasala Jang, Inspector General of Police, shoot at sight any military officer who tries to cross the bridge, correct? Yes, sir. But you did not convey these same orders to your men, correct? Yes, sir. And uh, when Cho where did Chongan Give, give you those orders? Where was you, where, what was your precise location when he gave those orders? It was uh, on the bridge. Where was Mr. Chongan at the time he gave those orders? He came, at the, at the, he came to assess the situation. He, came on, he met me on the bridge there. That's where he told me. Were other officers present apart from yourself? Yes, sir. Uh, I had uh, then, uh, the Army Liaison Officer to the Ministry of Defense, Captain Samsudin Sar. And uh, if my recollection is good, uh, Pambai was there, the who OC crime. Who was Pambai? Uh, uh, OC, I think it's called OC crime or OC, yeah. 
management, crime management unit. And uh, OC crime management unit was part of which uh, security unit? It was police, general duties. And who else? Uh, and the general duty, the photographer of the of the police. The photographer. Do you recall his name? No. Do you, re excuse me, uh, mm -hmm. nobody, may I advise members of the public not to attempt to talk to the witness who is testifying, he is under oath. The evidence or the information he provides must come from him and cannot be aided by any member of the public. Uh, please uh, try to comply with, with this. So, uh, Mr. Suare, uh, do you recall at around what time Mr. Chongan arrived at the, at the bridge? It was before nine. And uh, now you have received these orders from, your, from three of your superiors. Uh, what happened afterwards at the bridge? <coughs> because all these orders, when I received them, by then, uh, there is not yet any soldier at sight. It was only one uh, Lieutenant Jase of the uh, Navy who was going to work. He was even in a, in a commercial vehicle. I had to take him down from the commercial vehicle and ask him to uh, stay at the police station. Did you actually seal the bridge as ordered? Well, it was sealed tight. And, uh, what do you mean by it was sealed? What happened? No one sh could cross over the bridge, except uh, like Chongan and other military, you know, security officers. And what happened to the vehicles that brought people who were be going to Banjo? <clears throat> you know, uh, I forgot to mention one thing. That is, uh, at that time, there was uh, this uh, exercise that was supposed to have take place that day between the <coughs> American army and the, and the Gambian army. And uh, it was already announced <coughs> in the evening that uh, this, uh, the exercise will take place so that if uh, people see the military on exercise, let them not, let them not be scared. The evening uh, of which <coughs> date? You it said it was announced in the evening. In the evening of the, yeah, that is in the evening of the 21st. Yes, and, and we are on the 22nd. <clears throat> so many civilians or many people going to Banjul felt that the exercise shouldn't stop them from going to their normal work. And uh, vehicles were piled up from the bridge right now uh, where, example, uh, example, how can I put it? Well, before, before the now, now, before where the security is, they are piled up up to maybe mile five. A long way piled up on, on the coming from the combos. And you think that these people believed that it was the exercise that was going on and uh, notwithstanding they wanted to cross to go to Banjo? Yes, sir. Did you explain to the people who had gathered around there, uh, the purpose of the sealing of the bridge? No, sir, I could not. The only thing I told them that we receive orders that today you are not going to ban you. The bridge should be closed till further notice. Because I could not tell them that uh, we receive information that there will be a coup. Then uh, it will be, <laughs> that will turn them out to... <laughs> No one was chaos, huh? Yeah. 
Um, did you send the people back or you just informed them that and left them to decide whether they would stay or turn back? I was asking them to go back, but some people were adamant. They are waiting, they are still waiting. Did you at any time see soldiers? Yes, at around after nine, I saw a group of soldiers coming towards the bridge in tactical formation. Did you see how they arrived there? Yes, they were coming in tactical formation. That By is, what means did uh, they arrive? That's, uh, well, that uh, they are coming in bounds. That one, uh, let's say, three people will move forward. Three people will be back, covering them. When they reach at a certain point, the first people they will stop, take position. The order will will come and pass them. So on, in bounds. Do you know how they arrived? Uh, at uh, near to the bridge? Yeah, I saw them uh, uh, dropping from GPTC mini buses. Then there were these uh, mini GPTC mini buses. How many mini buses? Uh, they were in about two or three. Uh, Some were not in mini buses, but I saw the mini buses. Uh, how many soldiers did you see at this time? Uh, Approximately, I can. Uh, when I size them, I counted some roughly 40 soldiers, between 30 and 40. Uh, you said they approached in tactical formation. Yes. Uh, what would such an approach entail? What would it mean? Well, uh, it means that uh, they are. Uh, on a fighting movement, combat movement. How were they dressed? Well, they were battle ready. That is, they were in full uniform, and uh, they had uh, what we call chest webbing belts. What does that mean? Yeah, they are belts. They are, they are belts with uh, pouch with uh, pouch pouches where they put the magazines. What I counted for was the Chinese made, and you have four magazines on each belt, and uh, two grenades, one on the left, one on the side, hand grenades. And on their rifles. The AK-47, they have three magazines stuck together. There is a way that you just uh, cello tape them, then you use them one after the other. It's for, it's, it's for rapid fire, so that you will not be changing mag magazines at, uh, at the end of every, f every magazine. So you just on, take out the finished one and move the next one. We do it three in a sequence. Did they have other types of weapons? Yes. They have uh, RPGs and uh, uh, rocket propel grenades, commonly known here as bazooka, you know. And uh, they have uh, GPMGs, what we call uh, general purpose machine gun. They are these heavy machine guns with uh, rolls of. Uh, Rolls of uh, ammunition that you see on in the Rambo films, the one that they get, yeah. Were those the only type of weapons you saw them carry? Yes. And uh, did you see their leader at that moment? Yes. When I stepped up, I stepped up to meet them, and. Uh, they stop and Kopul Tumbul Tamba came up. He was uh, the leader of the of, of that unit. 
And I spoke to him, I asked him, where are you going to? Because it's unusual for a corporal to, <laughs> to handle such a, <laughs> such a large group. At least it should be a <laughs> lieutenant or a captain. So I asked him where are you going to? He said they are going on a mission they to Banjul. They are going to what? For a mission in Banjul. Did you ask him what I, mission? I asked they him were the nature to? of the mission which he refused to disclose. Then I asked him, How can you be with these people and where are your officers? Because it's not normal for you to, to handle uh, such a unit. He said, My officers are coming, they are behind. I told him, Then you are not going to cross the bridge. We, we're going to wait for your officers to come. So as you said, they are the only pe people who can tell me the, the nature of your mission. So we establish a no man's land. That is a buffer zone, almost uh, 100 meters apart. Before we would come to that, but uh, how did he look at the time when you met him? Well, uh, he was... Uh, A little bit haggard and smelling. I can have a smell of uh, alcohol. Did you think that he was drunk at the time? I think so, yeah. And uh, you agreed with him that you would establish a no man's land, as you call it, of 100 meters? Yes, sir. Explain what that means. Well, <clears throat> that is to have a buffer zone between us. They will stay away, uh, away from where we are standing for almost 100 meters. So let us imagine mm -hmm. that behind you is the bridge. Mm -hmm. uh, can you describe the Le taking the scenario that okay. you have here now, can okay. you describe uh, right. what that entailed? Okay. As I told you, I deployed my men almost on a horseshoe formation. That is uh, on the right, <coughs> on the right, it was somewhere concealed behind the police station. They took position behind the police station. See that the, from the bridge to the police station, at least you have uh, 10, 15 meters. And others were concealed on the left, uh, in, in the bushes. That's why it was something like a horseshoe formation. And I was at the middle. I had to walk towards right down where you have the, the security point to talk to him. So when I asked him, he has to move back. Still, the civilians, the, the civilians were there waiting in, in their vehicles. So, you, if I understand you well, you created some gap, some gap. space between them, your, your group and their group. Yes. Just like where you are seated, your men are behind you, and uh, my position here would be Tamba's position, and there is this gap in the middle, which would be the no man's land. Is that what you're trying to uh, say? My men were not completely behind me because I have them spread, you know, somewhere ahead of me, you know. So I was just at the middle. So the I have some behind, I have some on the right, a little bit further, and some on the left. So the no man's land would be, would be between you in the middle mm -hmm. and where Mr. Tamba's men were, is that correct? Yes. comply with that arrangement? He did. So he moved back about how many meters? About 100 meters. And, uh, for how long did that situation continue? Uh, it continued for almost uh, an hour. What happened next? <coughs> then uh, we, s we saw other GPTC buses coming through by the sideway because the traffic was congested. 
Then he looked up, he looked at, he walked back, him, uh, Tamba, went back to meet up those, uh, that TPTC boss. And I saw soldiers coming at a distance. I know those are soldiers coming out from the GPTC boss. He had some talk with the soldiers. Then he came back to me. Whilst coming back, he raised a white handkerchief as a flag coming to me. What does that mean in, in military science? Okay. If you raise it with your weapons, you need to talk. If you put down your weapons and raise it, you are surrendering. So when he did that, uh, what did you understand him to, to mean? That he wanted to talk. And uh, did me. you talk to him? Yes, sir. At what point, in, at, wh at which position did you talk to him? <coughs> we met at the middle, still at uh, the middle. Of the middle area. of the buffer zone? Buffer zone. And what did you talk about? Uh, when he came, he told me, your father said he knew that you were the one who, is, who will be here. Told him. Did you know who was referring to when, when who he was referring to when he said your course. father? I do. Who was he referring to? Yeah, Jame. So at this time, Yaya yeah, Jame was calling you his son? Yes. And then what, did, what else uh, happened? He said what that he, he wanted to talk to me. I told him, go and tell my son. I'm waiting. Let him come. Then uh, Yaya, Lieutenant Yaya Jame, Second Lieutenant Edward Singate, and uh, Captain Sonko. What's his first name, Captain Sonko? I cannot remember, but he has, he has a nickname, Kankurang. Could you say that again? Kankurang, that was his nickname. Would, it, would he be Captain Momodu Sonko? Mm. I want to help you. It's more Lamin Sonko. Oh. Yeah, maybe. I, as I said, you know, we are so used to last names and ranks that uh, sometimes we miss the, the first name. So, uh, Captain Sonko alias Kankurang. Mm -hmm. came with Yaya Jame, Lieutenant Yaya Jame, mm -hmm. and uh, Edward Singate. Second Lieutenant Edward Singate. Second yes. Lieutenant Edward Singate. Yes. And did you have a conversation with them? Of course I do. Um, and, tell uh, uh, tell they, us about it. They came together with uh, Tumbul, Kupul Tumbul Tamba. <coughs> then I had to chase Tumbul Tamba out of, the, out of, that, meeting, out of that meeting because uh, Tumbul is an NCO. When officers are talking, NCOs are not supposed to be there. What is an NCO? Non-commissioned officer. Proceed. And we were commissioned officers. Proceed. <clears throat> so, Yaya started ranting. You know, we're going to take this government, corruption and so on. Edward was more soft. So, you know, the situation, you know, all those, those running around. And uh, uh, Sonko this, wanted to... Take it easy, take mm -hmm. it easy. This is very important. Okay. We want to know at the time, mm -hmm. in which, what was their state of mind? Well, the smell of alcohol was very strong. Do you believe, di from whom did you smell this alcohol? From Yaya and Edward. Do you believe they were drunk at the time? I do. You said Yaya was ranting. Yes. And uh, would you say that W did that reinforce your belief that he was drunk? Yes, no, because I know that he had drinks. I knew that he, he used to drink. I knew it. It was not a secret. And uh, tell us 
as much as you can remember about what he said? <coughs> well, basically, what he was saying was about the corruption in the PPP government uh, that we should, uh, the military, they are going to take over the government and hand it over later to civilian government. Did he say after what time? No, there, then there was no time stated. Did he, what else did he say? Okay, then uh, they promised me a place in the cabinet. I told them I'm not interested. What place did they offer you? Foreign affairs or interior. In exchange for what? Did they for ask me joining for anything? Them. Could you say again? for me joining them and uh, what else happened well because uh, i forgot to mention that when i sized uh, kupul tamba and his men when i sized them observe uh, the weaponry they have i knew that i cannot myself and my men, we cannot stop them. Because they were more armed than us. When it comes to only AK-47, there are six, uh, there are seven magazines. AK-47, we are only two, that's 60 rounds. And they have seven, seven, seven times, so that's two, uh, 21, 2,100 rounds. They have grenades, hand grenades. We don't have any. That, that, that would be 210. Two, yeah, 210. Uh, they have grenades, and uh, we don't have any grenades. They have rocket propel grenades. We don't have it. And our concealment, uh, our defensive position was not that tenable because it was not prepared. You cannot, you know, it's a simple logic. You cannot ask the police to stop the army. That cannot be. The, I mean, uh, the weaponry are not the same. The police are, uh, are not equipped to fight an army. So you made that assessment and you concluded that you could not possibly stop them? Yes, sir. What decisions did you make after that assessment? After that assessment, I tried to buy time to see if something else uh, an alternative can be done to stop them, but not with my men. It can, it's not possible. And they were so drunk that I knew that if, if uh, an incident happened there at the bridge, no one could stop the carnage. I will call it carnage. What did you say to them when but, they offered you the position of Minister for Foreign Affairs or Interior, in I've exchange for your cooperation, what did you say to them? I've told them that I'm not interested. Because I questioned Ed. I told him, you, you are not married, you have no kid. The same thing to you. You are not married, you have no kid. You don't have any responsibility. I have wife and kids. If I should join you, it should be on my terms because I want to save life and property. Said what they asked me my terms. I told them I'll take command from the bridge up to the state house, and you will not act. You'll only act on on on, on my command. They agreed. And then what happened after that? Then I asked them time to talk to my men. I've called them up, they've fallen, and I briefed them, I spoke to them. They, they all consented, and I asked them to turn their barrier, because we were using gray barriers, gray, and the army is using black. So I asked them to turn their barrier so that the black side will come, come out. They put it as such. How about your men who were in ambush positions? Did you bring them also to fall in? No, those, those are out of that place. 
I just call the men who were there because Minty and others were away. How about your men who were concealed? Yes, I, I, call, I call them out. Those are the people that I called out. So when you turn, got, got them to agree to your new orders, you got them to turn their barrets to put mm. the black on top. Yes. What else did you do? I left mine as it is, gray. And uh, <coughs> what happened to these two groups now? You have Yaya Jame and his group, and now you have your group who have turned their barrets upside down. Yeah. And what happened after that? They shake hands and fraternize and became one group. So you amalgamated the yeah, groups, yeah. the two groups, and then you took command of this new group, correct? Yes. What happened after <coughs> that? Then I asked them, I asked Yaya to move tactically towards Banjal. I am going I'm going in front because I have some ambushes on the way. And I'm the only one at that moment who could uh, defuse those ambushes. Because as I said, I was out to save life and property. So uh, you told us earlier mm -hmm. that your group was about 48 men divided into two groups. Yeah. Uh, the mobile group was with Minte, but they were away, away from the bridge at that moment. Yes. So you were left with about 33 stationed at the bridge. Yes. And Jame's group was about 40 men. But they added more when they came. They added more when they came. Do you know how many? No, I cannot, I cannot recall. When the three groups were put together, your one group of, of 33, mm -hmm. the Tumbul Tamba group of 40, mm -hmm. and the group that arrived with the Ayajame, when they were all put together, mm -hmm. do you have a rough estimate of how many men we are talking about? Mm, we may, may talk of hundred. Uh, okay, I forgot to mention that uh, the reinforcement for the state guard, they were coming from Bakau, from uh, Fajaras. The, the reinforcement from state guard we are part of it because so apart from your group of 33 that were at the bridge yeah. you receive reinforcement of state guards from fajara barracks correct no from uh, they have their uh, they had their own barracks on around behind uh, mrc yeah they, they have their own barracks behind mrc how many men arrived yeah it was around um, between 15 and 20. And you all, you took command of that group as well, correct? Yes. And that group also joined this new group yeah. under your command? Yeah. You told us that you ordered the Ayajame and orders to move tactically towards Banjul. Yes. While you go and deal with the ambushes that were on the way, correct? Yes. Okay. So, can you explain what you mean by that? Yeah. What I mean by that is uh, let them not rush, because if not, they were going to use vehicles and rush to Manjal. And I asked them to walk and move slowly. Because what would have happened if they had taken vehicles and rushed towards Banjo? Then uh, there were going to be some, some deaths. Because already, as I said, the orders, the police and everybody received shoot at sight. Yeah. That's, that, that's the standing order, shoot at sight. So, correct me if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. Your decision to go ahead mm -hmm. and deal with these ambushes mm -hmm. was intended to clear the way for Yaya and his group when they move to Banjul, correct? Tactically, I can say yes or no, because I ha in my, uh, my intention was not only to clear, but to reach Banjul and see what 
we can have as help to deal with, with the situation. Because there was no communication at that time. Not, then there was no mobile phone or anything else. And uh, the, the police communication system was already taken over. So did you move to Banjul eventually? Yes, sir. And uh, on your way to Banjul, did you come across any uh, officers? On, on my way to Banjul, uh, I come across uh, Mr. Uh, ASP Edward Sambo. Edward Bef Sambo. Before you met him, did you come across any other officer? No, it was Edward Sambo that I met just at the entrance of the bridge from Banjul side. Did you have a conversation with him? Yes, I do. What did you tell him? So I told him that uh, because he didn't see them then, he was on the other side of the bridge. I told him, well, these people, we cannot, st we cannot stand them. We call them the boys, then that's what uh, I used to work. These boys, we cannot stand them. And I told him, the people who were in charge, the one I uh, saw, then it was Edward and Yaya. I told him that we cannot stand them, so let's go back to headquarters and see what we can do. On our way, we met up one of our trucks who was driven by one uh, Sergeant Gumbolo, I can remember that, Gumbolo. We boarded the truck. And we met with uh, Captain Samsudin Sar, and there was one double PC who was uh, on traffic station by the oil mill. I asked her to go in and hide herself. So in Banjul, I dropped Edo by Hagan Freight, and I continued with uh, Samsudin Sar to the marine unit. At this time, at Hagen Street, yes, uh, you are close to police headquarters, correct? Yes, sir. Uh, your superior officers, where were they based at this moment? Uh, police headquarters. Uh, police headquarters and marine unit, which was closer to you at it the was, time? It was police headquarters. Did you go to the police headquarters? I went there after going to the marine unit. So you decided to go to the marine unit first before you went to police headquarters, correct? Yes. At this stage, you told the commission that the police communications system had gone down, correct? Correct. So when you left, up to the time Yaya Jame and his group arrived, you negotiated with them and you had your agreement with them. You have not had any communication with your superiors in Banjul, correct? Correct. And when you had the chance to arrive in Banjul, you did not immediately go to your police headquarters to report to your superiors, correct? Correct. You chose to go to the marine unit instead, right? Correct. Tell us what happened at the marine unit? At the marine unit, uh, I met uh, uh, com uh, the marine unit commander, Saho, Antuman. Did you go alone to the marine unit or you were accompanied? I was with uh, Captain Samshuddin Sar. What was the mode of transport? It was a police truck, a big truck. Where did you get that police truck from? When we descended the bridge, when we descended the bridge towards Banjul, that's when we met the truck. We were driven by uh, Gumbolo. So you took the truck and then you moved to Banjul? Yes, sir. And you went to the marine unit. You met Saho, you said? Yes, sir. You know his full name? And Antuman Saho. What was his position? 
he was the commander of the marine the navy uh, yeah. and what happened to that well uh, i was uh, requesting for heavy weaponry from him because at that time it is only the navy which had some heavy weapons because when it comes to the presidential guard i knew what they have in arms and ammunition because i am the one who supplied them from the armory i know all the uh, weaponry they don't have anything that can be of a help and the marine unit they had some uh, heavy machine guns and uh, some uh, anti-aircraft guns. What did you need that heavy, heavy weaponry for? That was for a standoff. What standoff? Standoff uh, with uh, Yaya's group. This is no longer Yaya's group, remember? This is now your Okay, group. my group. <laughs> so you were looking for weapons to attack your own group. Is that what you want us to believe? Yes. Did you get any? No, sir. What did you do next? What I did next, were, that was the last hope that I had. What I did next, I went to the police headquarters. Uh, the IG was not there and I met Chongan. And I told him crystally clear that, well, uh, things are over. Because we cannot stand them. And uh, already my men are with them. So, we cannot fight them. Uh, you're telling this commission that you met Chongan at police headquarters. Yeah, at his office. And you told him that you had already surrendered yeah. to Yaya Jami and his people. Yes. What did he say to you? He told that it was a joke. Because that's, that's the way I'm saying it. Because he said that we must fight them. And uh, because he didn't see them at that time, he have never, he ha haven't seen them, he haven't seen Tumultama, he haven't seen anybody. He has only the orders that he received uh, from uh, the IG that he wanted to enforce. I told him they are not f enforceable because you will bring a carnage if you try to stop them right now, and you don't have no friendly forces. You cannot depend on the presidential guard. You cannot depend on the, uh, how to call it? That's the time that he told me that uh, they have overrun the Fajara barracks and uh, Turo Jauni is nowhere to be found. He told me that in his office. Did you tell Chongan that at that stage you had become part of Jamie's group and that you are in fact the commander of that group. I've told him crystally clear that I'm with them. I have my men with them and I will not leave my men over there. I'm going back to them. Did he have you arrested? No. Wouldn't it be normal that under such circumstances he should have you arrested? If in an established thing, yeah. It should have been, but uh, the situation was so tense and uh, there was no manpower. He listened to me. He understood what I have told him. Would you be surprised that Mr. Chongan had no recollection of this? In fact, according to his testimony, he was shocked to see you at the bar at, at police headquarters and he did not have any conversation with you other than to tell you to join him in his vehicle and head back to the bridge. Uh, well, it's 23 years ago, but I can fully remember. Mm -hmm. From there, from his office, 
from his office. I went downstairs to RSMCC. He was heading complaint and discipline, and uh, he was one of the experienced gendarmes, uh, former field force to gendarm and TSG. He did a tour of duty in uh, in Liberia, the first tour of duty, and I explained to him the weapons that these people have that we cannot. There's no way that we can stop them. Did Mr. Chongan leave you behind at the police? No. What we, happened? We went together in his vehicle. It was a Pajero. We went together with his... I went with him in his Pajero and some men to, that, to an ambush that he set at uh, Stincon. Uh, no, Radio Seat. Where, what were you going to do? When we set out, I was trying to convince him to, to uh, lift the ambush, which he did not. And uh, I dropped from uh, Radio Seed. There was a coming 504. Oh, oh, hold a second, hold a mm -hmm. second. Uh, you are suggesting that on the way from police mm -hmm. headquarters mm -hmm. to Radio Seed, mm -hmm. you are trying to convince AIG Chongan yes. to, to not resist the coup, correct? Yes. But would it surprise you that Mr. Chongan also has no recollection of this particular conversation? I won't be surprised because it's 23 years ago. Uh, so here we are. Mm -hmm. The first conversation mm -hmm. you said, mm -hmm. which occurred at police headquarters, mm -hmm. Mr. Chongan had no recollection of it. Mm -hmm. Again, the second conversation mm -hmm. in the vehicle ride bet mm -hmm. uh, between police headquarters to radio seat, Mr. Chongan also had no recollection of that conversation. Okay. Don't you find it odd? Uh, it surprised me. So at Radio Seed, mm -hmm. you dropped. Mm -hmm. You left the vehicle. Mm -hmm. Did you tell Miss? Did you have any other conversation with Mr. Chongan? I told him that I am going to meet my men. Then uh, a five o four was coming from. The prisons, a prison 504. They wanted to go for the market for their lunch and so on. Because still now people don't know what's going on. They thought it was just a normal exercise. I commended the 504 and went to meet, uh, went to meet uh, the, uh, the group, Yaya and others. I just met them at the outskirts of the prisons. I dropped, they left the vehicle and took over the command. At this stage, mm -hmm. what was Mr. Chongan doing? I left, I left him at his ambush area. Would you say that he was organizing his ambush? Yes, I left him there. And he was still at the posture of resisting the, the coup? Yes. So you went back to the group with yes. Yaya. Yeah. You reclaimed command of that group, right? Yes. So now you are leading the coup, correct? Yes. And, uh, what else did you do? I asked them to move about 100 or 150 meters behind me on tactical formation. So I was walking ahead in the middle of the road. Did you have your beret torn to no. show that you were? Still now, no. So uh, by still having that gray beret, mm -hmm. walking, walking on the middle of the road, mm -hmm. you knew at this point where the ambushes were located, correct? Yes. Did you communicate with these ambushes on the road? 
No, I communicated with the head of the ambush, the Chonga. But yes, you did communicate yeah. with Chonga. Yes. Uh, but but there were other elements of the ambush who were concealed in the shrubs and in other places. Yes. Did you speak to this man? Not at that moment, because when I when uh, I reached almost the phone factory. I was raising, because I know that I was raising my weapon with my left hand and raising my right hand, shouting at them not to shoot. They started shooting. And they started shooting. And I turned back, telling the, the others, yeah, and others, not to respond. Do you Fine. know? Do you know who was shooting? I know some of them. I call their names. Who? I call uh, late Valentine. What's his full? What is he? Harry name? Valentine. What rank was he at the time? Uh, he was ASP. And who else? I call uh, Inspector C. I else? call uh, Job. I forgot his first name. How about Chongan? Did you see? I him didn't there? call him up. I did it. Did you see him there? No. But I know he was there. How do you know that? <laughs> okay. I, d I, dro I dropped him. Between uh, the time that I dropped from his vehicle and uh, the time we came back, the shooting started, it was less than uh, 25 minutes. So it was... Uh, one police officer called Kamara, I forget his first name, he wa he who was uh, behind a tomb, taking position behind a tomb. He was the one who was shouting, Commander Chongan is here, Commander Chongan is here. At this stage, Correct me if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. You were basically outing mm -hmm. the ambushes and getting them to cooperate. Is yes. that right? Yes. You did that as the person who was leading the group that was staging the coup, correct? Protecting life and property. In, in, in protecting life and property. When uh, this man said Commander Chongan was there, did you see him at any point? No. Gunshots that were that 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 were made as at the time you were approaching. For how long did did, did they go on? Well, they went for two three minutes. And they stopped. Yes. What did you do after that? When they stopped, the ambush, they came out, and uh, their weapons... Did anybody call them out? Yeah. Actually, I was calling them out. You, so knew, you knew exactly where these ambushes were, correct? Yes. You knew the personnel who were I know some the of the personnel. And you called them out? I called them out. As their superior officer? Yeah. And they complied? They complied. And what happened after that? Uh, their weapons were seized and put in a truck. In military parlance, they were disarmed, Yes. Right? And uh, what happened to their weapons? It was put in a truck. And what happened to the men who were disarmed? Uh, had a short conversation with them, exp explaining to them what happened and so on. What did you say to them? Now I've told them that, well, this is a coup and uh, we have no chance of, of stopping them. I think it's better to join them than to create havoc at this, at this, moment, at this time. Did you we tell them that now you are in fact leading the coup? No, I didn't say anybody I am leading the coup. I've never said that to anyone. It's no, uh, only, what I it mean is only, is, hold on. What I mean is, uh, let me rephrase the question. Mm -hmm. Did you tell them 
that as at this time you were taking command of the group that was leading the coup? No. Tell I told that only to Yaya, Edward, and uh, Sonko. So you did not say that to the men? No. You did not say that to Chongan? No. You did not say that to any of your superior officers? Only these three people. You know, I just want to put it on the record that yeah. you did not say it to any of your superior officers. Yes. You did not even say it to those at the Marine Unit? No. You did not say it to Captain Samsudin Sar, with whom you rode from the bridge to the, uh, to the Marine Unit? No. Not even to Sambo? No. It was only to these three people? Yes. So at this stage, you have outed all those in the ambush and got them disarmed and now what happened after that now we move on walking towards banjo in what formation tactical formation who led that i and uh, where exactly did you go in banjo now, uh, before arriving banjo there was a cotton tree uh, by the cemetery that's where which cemetery christian or christian Muslim cemetery but okay. just before gambia high school that's where i saw minty and his team i saw minty i know his team was there which minty are you left in minty my mobile it's getting exciting mm -hmm. uh, let's give each other mm -hmm. five seconds and mm -hmm. try not to speak over each other mm -hmm. all right okay so, which Lieutenant Minte was this? Bini Minte. You mean the Lieutenant in charge of the mobile unit at the time? Yes, sir. And did you have a conversation with him? <coughs> yes, sir. What did you say to him? I have told him that uh, as long as we cannot stop them and uh, to live, to save life and property, these people, I told him categorically, these people are so drunk and agat, and they are, they are edgy at this moment. It is better just to join them and finish up this thing. If not, there will be a carnage. These people, they are, they are ready for, for, for anything. And Minty comply and understood. And I asked him to turn his bearer. All the time that I was talking to Minty and Jaju, they are, uh, Yaya and others are still far behind me. So they were waiting to get the results. When they saw that Minty turned his bearer and the others, everybody turned their bearer, they knew now it's okay. Uh, this is you would agree with me that this would have been the third line of defense uh, yes. that was mounted. Yes. The first was your defense at the bridge. The second was the ambush yes. uh, around Radio Seed. Mm -hmm. And the third now is Gambe High School, yes. uh, area where Minty and his team were. Yes. So third line of defense, all cleared, mm -hmm. correct? Yes. And... Uh, Minte and his group, were they disarmed? No. They joined yes. the other force? Yes. And still under your leadership, correct? Yes. What happened after that? When we went to the roundabout. Perhaps uh, uh, it's now five minutes to the lunch break. Uh, I'll leave it at that and give the commissioners the chance to ask a few questions. And uh, the line of questioning is interesting. Uh, we have our own strategy as to the kind of information we want to elicit. We'll crave indulgence that it not be interrupted. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. But you still would allow, I mean, we think that commissioners can ask some questions. Yes. Uh, if yes. I may, um, Mr. Suare, I'm a bit puzzled. Puzzled at uh, the quick transformation on your part from going to defend the bridge and uh, becoming uh, leader of the coup. 
that quick transformation puzzles me a little bit. Um, the obeying of your command by the group, what's the, there must be some background to that. They trusted you. If you weren't part of the plot earlier, for them to turn around and accept your command, you leading them, you giving command and uh, they not um, uh, disobeying you uh, for that. That's what puzzles me a little bit. Maybe you can help me clear that. Sir, I will not brag on that. That is, uh, anyone who worked under me has trust on me. Because as I said, I never left my junior man down. I have always put my junior man first. And I said, I have a long relationship with Yaya. He trusted me a lot. He respected me. And I told you that uh, when he was a little bit difficult to command, but with me, I have never had any, any difficulty with him. As well as Edward, all those people, they trusted, they respected me and trusted me as an officer. I was known to be a man of his words. That's why I believe, that's why they trusted me. But was there any conflict in your own mind that not having discussed anything with them before, and as I said, the uh, commission that you were given to go defend the bridge, and uh, suddenly, or oh, within a very short time, you became head of uh, this group that is trying to change the situation. Was there any conflict in your own mind about that transformation? Well, this was a strategic decision because uh, when we come to it, I may accuse the general government of being they, they prepare their own coup by not having a counterbalance to the army. Because I can fully remember uh, when uh, the three containers of arms came from China, then I was the commander of the mobile general Murray. Then the general Murray was on. I had a long talk with then Colonel Daunyai that we, the General Murray, we needed some of those weapons, especially the 80 millimeter uh, mortars you know, and some uh, GPMGs and so, so that I can train my men on those weapons. But he categorically refused that those weapons are men and they for the army and it will remain for the army. And, well, one can tell you that uh, I was born in 1956, then in 81, I was not a kid. I could recall what happened in 81. I have seen what happened in 81. Those who sacrificed their life, what happened to their families after 81, and all what happened I was present. I was here in 81. So that's why I say it's it's, it was a strategic decision. And my decision was not to be part of the coup. If, if it was, I was going to, the way I became the, the leader, I could have been the president if I wanted to, if I was part of the coup. Because I would not accept my second lieutenant or a lieutenant to be, to be my commander when I was in the cooking. Because I knew that what I was expecting to have help, and the only help that I was expecting is uh, uh, from the Marine Unit. I knew the Senegalese will never come again to help because of their bitter experiences with the Jawara government. That's why I said I was trying to save life and property. 
it doesn't make sense to try to fight them. It doesn't make sense because they will just massacre us in 10 minutes and, and go along. And I'll assure you, if one was killed, if one person was killed, it may be worse than 81. Because at least 81, we had rag tags, people who were not trained. And they freed the prisoners. We have rag tags. And this time we have trained soldiers, professionals. And some have seen battle in Liberia. It's a, it's a complete different ball game. Thank you very much. Commissioners, yeah. let me just start with on that side. Um, John, Commissioner Jallo. Commissioner Jallo, I am surprised that you, as a very well-trained army officer, was given an instruction to shoot at first sight. Why didn't you carry that order? Sir, I've told you that I assess the situation because I know what I have. I know what I can do with what I have. And when I saw what they have, I know what it can do. It was not going to do any good. If that was the case, today we will not be here because the, I'm not using the killing, what killing, but I'm using carnage carnage because it was going to be very awful because most of those elements sorry most of those elements I said they were drunk and they were not properly trained with those weapons because still still if you know you you will see that those weapons were never been used you'll see the oil to keep them Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. My, I say, Imam Abdul Rahman C. So I bang lai lai. Sa guru bi ag guru bi ay jame bengen tase. Ag bengen wakta ne be jogan te logo bengen jubo. Jubo bo bo bengen jubo on chiko ulegi nain dogal kubi. Wala bengen jubo on chiko nain bai. Legi nyar el bihitam. Am na kadu binga wakfi kadu bora fella. Paska soto ponsa njidi linda digalon bonye bode me kogi sfetala bo fetala on dubak musiba na lonam aglinga wakitam so gise defo lulu denga lon ar nini denga lon ar ala lini nini agbakandu me adama ilulu mum kontan na jira fena trop wa elegi lingen jubo on lulu man labu on galera alma. Can I, can I answer in Wolof? Okay. Jubobu Jubobi Lenala Man Hauma Numakumuna Wahe Olof. Why did I name Hedamada Nahembo? Why Dabado Nahembo? Near Buni Jubo, Fofu, Sumahel Nekuton Jubo. Suma khel mo ne ko nakala nakala na muna tarrele buntela ega banyul benje ma sed na dina muna am lule na ndi balfenen ngir kom numa ko wahe mo ne kane soldar bi ak polis bi dafa uti bu gana yi nyowe cha jamano bo bo bizana muri banga am. La Tewona Ganai, Tigana Yui, Moe Gana Yure, Pur Jangal Chi, because Gana Soko Ametam, Jeffo Loko, Jangu Loko, Njeringam Dina New, Tedai Neka Ludenia Roschiniki, because Soko Hamud Munoko, Gobgoko Yore, Lulumum Muna in the Mosibo. Buma Jang, Buma Late Lulu Johun Mako, Nunema Lulu Pur Soldar Silla, the Pusana Muribi. Te bun tase zana muribi, takawal zana muribi. Bole ko police bi, policei legi zana muribi tu de TSG amu ngana ipurhe. Hamga ngana yuhe, 
Ganda yu place paquet ak luñu waxan grenade fete euh yu sanni ci loxo ñom ñu ko amé ñun loolu suma gaay sax suñ ko gisé mu ci cinéma lañ ko gisé ya ñu ngi amé tam euh machine fete li machine yu yu dj yu am doole yi comme su féké né bay nga say soy sétane fi mi ay rambo yek fi mi hehe américain da nga ñu ko yoré def ci bal yu bari ni ñun loolu amuñ ko amuñ nga nay té ko amoon gannaay do mu na xéx ko am gannaay nit ki ku nek dafa am bakken nit ki loy ndjikké ci aduna ci mo nek lan sécurité mu ngi doggé ci sa bop ak ci ki sa bop self prévision self prévision ci fi lañ ko fék ku nek lo lay ndjikké té lu mo wax li tam lu sét la mané éti won fék na amna lu mbon bon ñaar fuk ak juroom doona tuma xalé gis na lu xew éti won kenn netali wuma ko luma gis la te gis na nu mujje gis na ño xamne sen baken dañ ko tegon gis na nuy mujje sen joboti gis na nuy mujje ñu sacrifice on sen bop ak gis na nuy nu len ngour gi traiter so man tam di fuma jaar ma sikios mo bop jek thank you very much commissioner kinte yeah yeah commissioner kinte um mr suare My first point is uh, your defiance of the order and your introduction of your own order were twofold. Apart from asking the security not to uh, um, resist, you also initiated controlling ordinary vehicles, which was not within the orders you were given. They did not say no transport across the bridge. They said no soldier. So ordinary passengers going to work and orders should have been left to go on normal business. One, the advantage of that would have been that place would not be congested with uh, um, uh, civilians to be sealed, in other words. Because I wouldn't want to suit because there are civilians. When we suit here, there will be many. That's one area that I did not think an intelligent person, officer like you, would have uh, encouraged. If you weren't um, involved in the planning, or you, if you had not uh, adequately cherished the, the, the welcome, the uh, this thing. One, two. You said you knew you did not have the capacity. That was well before. But then, in fact, there is a capacity that's already uh, segregated or, or, or divided from the main camp, which could do some amount of resistance. That's the marine. Um, when your uh, superiors uh, gave you the order and you knew it was imprudent, because that's, why, that's what you are impressing me anyway, that you knew it was imprudent, so you said, hold on until I give order. Didn't you, I thought as an intelligent trained officer like you, would have thought that let's also enhance, reinforce ourselves with that uh, similar sophisticated, high-powered machinery from the uh, marine To, to, to reinforce us, and then there will be some amount of resistance. Two. Three, I, I, I don't understand why you prejudice the fact that we wouldn't have foreign support at all. We could have explored it. There was an avenue if you had given the chance. But all of this, you, 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 you um, I don't know how to call it. You made so none of this worked, and then all of a sudden you enhanced. What is what was wrong? Thank you, Mr. Commissioner Kente. I think uh, I have raised the issue here of what we call the intelligent bayonet. That is a knife with two sharp sides. Those things. You are trained as an officer on this knife of two. 
uh, two, two sides, sharp, two edges. Well, you had the chance to take your initiative on those, on orders. But it's too, if you succeed, it won't cut you. Although you defy orders. But if you succeed, it won't cut you. But if you fail, it will, it will cut you. These are some of the initiatives that I took. It was my responsibility. When they give me the order to shoot at sight, that those were the orders in the office. Those were in the office. I am on the ground. This, that's why we have always what we call uh, staff officers and field officers. They, they are different. They can be trained in the same school, everything, but when it comes to mentality, there is a little bit of difference. And as you said, I can swear on my kids and everything. I have never been part of this. The only contact I had with them is there at the bridge. And I did it to save life and property. That's why I knew definitely that we couldn't stop them. And as I said, they were edgy. I'm not a psychologist, but I could see and sense that these people, they are on the edge. Just let me tell you. They felt let. Like, I'm not there, but one can see that they felt that already they've been discovered. They took the advance. Because, as I said, the, the first mistake was not to arrest them that day, that night. As they were not arrested, they knew now things, if it is not completely known, but at least uh, investigation may get onto them. So, they regroup at night and uh, took action. And definitely for the whole night, those people didn't sleep. You can see it from their eyes. And as I said, they were drunk. And they were all out. It was it or death. And they were determined. Excuse me, I will follow up. You have answered one part of it. The other part is, you were not asked to stop the normal traffic, and you did, one. No, and no. two, hold on, hold on. you know, there were substitutes that would have uh, complemented you, and you failed to until at a time when it, it wasn't necessary. Good, here we come. I'm a field officer. I'm on the field. The staff officers, as I said, it was their responsibility to look for substitute, not me, the field officer on the field. As I said, when it was when when I felt that I was I was uh, to get, look for something that was during the January time, I went to ask for weapons. But at this moment, at this juncture, it was not me. It was the it was the responsibility of the command to provide for me so I can do what they want me to do. It was not my responsibility to go and s search for what I need to come and do what I need to do. And, uh, Perhaps, sorry, sorry, uh, sorry, sorry, let me come. And you were talking about uh, the possibility of having help somewhere. I told you that uh, in the, in 81, I was not a kid. I was not a kid in 81. I knew what happened and everything. Sorry. And for any help. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, perhaps uh, this yeah. is a convenient yeah. my, my time my to break. Here, excuse me. Hold a second, hold a second, my, Commissioner. My, my point here, Suare, is not now about, because you stopped the traffic before the appearance of the, of the junta. Uh, hold on, just an, don't answer yet. So already you had already arranged something that is stop the traffic. I said that was defiance, that was not in the order, and it, it wasn't necessary. Because you said those traffic, uh, the passengers and drivers, whatever, you did not disclose to them what you, what you had had or were strategizing. 
So you could have just let them go if there was nothing else. That's what I said. I said, if, yes, you, it's not your mandate to go and search for um, uh, other um, weapons that, we are, that could challenge this. But you could have think of proposing it to those uh, uh, responsible. That's what I'm saying. Thank you, Thank you very much, Chairman. Commissioner Akinte. May we, uh, please don't respond right away. I think we will take the other questions, and you can take them uh, on block uh, towards the end. Uh, Commissioner uh, uh, Mr. Jones. Ch Mr. Please. Chairman, yes, please. Uh, can we possibly do this after the lunch break? Yeah, I, I know. Otherwise, but otherwise it would obstruct the, the, the scheduling. And yeah. it may have some I, I know, but effects. just allow these uh, few questions from the other commissioners to be fair to them as well. I'm sorry. Uh, please go ahead, Commissioner Jones. Commissioner Jones, um, thank you, Mr. Suare. Um, I'm just trying to um, make meaning of um, your narration because um, from what you explained, it seemed um, the disbandment of the gendarmerie, sorry to take you back a little further, um, could have been or could be perceived as a contributing factor that led to the 1994 coup. And um, again, when, this, when the gendarmerie was disbanded, it seemed like um, the leaders of or the members of the 1994 coup were those of were members of the gendarmerie that moved to the army and not to the and were not um, part of the police with the TSG. So I just wanted to know at that time, how was it decided who moves to the army and who moves to the police? Was it a personal decision? And then secondly, regarding the weapons that the gendarmerie had, um, how was this distributed? Was everything moved to the army or were some given to the police as well? Thank you. Thank you very much, I'm a Commissioner Kaur. Commissioner Kaur. I have two questions. One is um, your position on self-preservation. How does it fit into your pledge um, to, to defend this country against security threats? The second is you said you, you, there was a relationship of trust between you and the officers organizing the coup. Don't you think you could have done more to uh, convince them to abort the, uh, the coup using that? Thank, thank you very much, um, uh, uh, Council, would you want him to take these questions um, uh, up to the break or can he give uh, short answers to the commissioners and then uh, we, we can continue. take them after the break he would have had time to think about them yeah. after the break is that okay the commissioners you don't mind yeah okay right. thank you very much we take a one hour break and uh, we'll be back here <coughs> at uh, two, uh, two, 2 30. proceedings for the afternoon and we have an hour and a half to go um, I hope you all had a good break and a good lunch and good prayers and prayed for all of us for as I said at the beginning for the Almighty to guide and protect our uh, protect our proceedings uh, council you have the floor we may continue uh, thank you thank you very much mr. chairman uh, there are two pending questions that the witness was asked uh, before we went on break. Perhaps he should be given the opportunity to respond to those questions. Uh, if my recollection serves me well, those were questions asked by Commissioner Jones and Commissioner Carr. Thank you very much. You may continue with the witness and my counsel. Uh, could you kindly answer the last two questions you were asked by Commissioner Jones and Commissioner Ka. If my recollection serves me well, Commissioner Ka's question uh, dealt with uh, whether you felt it was best to self-preserve instead of uh, uh, implement the orders you were given. Could you kindly answer to that? Well, <clears throat> I want to let the uh, Commissioner Kat know that even in the battlefield, when the soldier is fighting another soldier, he has in back of his mind self-preservation. That's the fourth thing for a human being. It's only 
suicide, suicide uh, attackers that doesn't care about self-preservation. Even in the battlefield, you want to go home. May I continue my examination from that? Third Commissioner Jones had asked also a question. Yeah, yeah. you're reminding uh, about that. Yes, uh, okay. Commissioner Jones asked uh, this question about uh, the arms. Uh, perhaps Commissioner Jones can just repeat the question, please. Um, yes, the question was um, at the disbandment of the gendarmerie, who decided um, which officers went to the army and uh, the police, and the second one, what happened to the weapons? All right, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the gendarmerie was not that much heavily armed. Okay. Uh, for, uh, for the choice, it was left to the officers to choose where to go. And I said uh, only two commissioned officers choose to go to the army and uh, a sergeant and few other ranks. Not much went to the army. Almost all the gendarmerie uh, stayed with the police. Um, uh, I now resume my examination of the witness on a point of clarification on this answer you have just given. Um, we, I recall in your earlier testimony, you suggested that the military police uh, in the gendarmerie moved to the army. Um, did they move as a unit or only a few uh, men from the military police unit uh, went to the army? I can say that 90% uh, of the military police went to the army. Uh, thank you very much for that clarification. Um, earlier on, you testified about July 22nd, and uh, you, your testimony went as far as um, events that happened at Gambe High School when at this point you were able to talk to Lieutenant Kinte, uh, Bineminte, excuse me, Lieutenant Bineminte, who was uh, at that time uh, the commander of the mobile unit that was deployed. And uh, he also agreed to join the group. Uh, and then he also and his men turned their barrets upside down. Unlike the police, they were not disarmed. Is that a summary of what has happened? Correct. Uh, can you now uh, tell us what happened after that? From Gambe High School, now that this group has joined uh, the larger group, uh, what happened? Uh, uh, when we read it uh, roundabout, we divided into two groups, Edward and Minty and Sonko and Jaju. They went through Independence Drive going towards State House. Okay, point of clarification mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. The group that you met at the bridge, it comprised, you said, Captain Momodu Sonko. Uh, Lieutenant Yaya Jame and uh, Sub Lieutenant Edward Singate, correct? As I said, they went. No, I, could you answer that question? That is the group you'd met with at the bridge and discussed. Correct. Who was senior in rank amongst them? Sonko was senior in rank, he was captain. Was Sonko in charge of the group or not at that time? No, Sonko was not in charge. Sonko, one can call it as a drafty. He just came and joined, maybe willingly or unwillingly. Because all those who were within the group were battle ready. What do I mean by battle ready, dress battle ready? They were in full gears. And as I said, the webbing belts and you know 
AK-47, three, three magazines on the AK-47, and Sonko was wearing just a camouflage uh, shirt, a trouser, boots, and holding a pistol. So that one was not battle ready. Then he, in, he was not initially with the people who left. Who left where? Uh, who, uh, who left Yundum Barracks. And in my interaction with them, it has proven that it was Yaya, <coughs> Yaya who was uh, in charge. So um, this group, together with those, the reinforcement uh, from, from Bakau that came was added to the group, joined the group, and uh, those who were in the ambushes were disarmed. Now, Binemin, Lieutenant Bineminte and his group also joined. Uh, you arrived at Independence Drive. One group went through Independence Drive. And where did the other group go to? The other group, it was my, as officers, myself and Yaya that I can recall, and the others, we went through Marina Parry. How was it decided that at that junction of uh, Independence Drive and Marina Parade, <coughs> you separated into two groups? How was that decision made? I made the decision. And uh, what did you say to them? Because uh, you may know that... Uh, we have all Atlantic residents, all Atlantic hotel. We have the state guards who were resident there. And uh, they needed, we, we needed to have them because, as I said, um, excuse out, me, excuse me, could you say that again? We needed to what? We needed to get them on the side because. As I said, I was out to save life and property. The gray, what, what would the gray side of the Beret do for you at that time? <clears throat> the gray side of the Beret shows two orders that I am not part of the coup group uh, at first sight. So that Make, made it possible for those in defensive positions to accept you. Is that what you're saying to us? Correct. And uh, that would give you the opportunity to go and talk to them without being fired at? Correct. So why did you make this decision? To, to have a part of the group go through Independence Drive and then another part go through Marina Parade? One shouldn't put all his eggs in one basket. It was strategic. Uh, strategic aim at what objective? Objective was taking State House. Are you suggesting that at the time you felt that if one group went, took, if all the entire group took one route, uh, that would not be the best course of action? Is that what you're suggesting? Correct. When you decided to split the group into two, uh, did the other officers have any objection to it? duly complied with your suggestion? Yes. Was it an order or a suggestion? <clears throat> well, uh, it, it was not as an order per se, because uh, I showed them the, the possibilities. It, it, it makes more sense to be in two groups, one independent drive, one marina. Okay. And... Uh, you and Yaya Jame 
and, the, and that group, you went through Marina Parade. And what happened along the way? Uh, when we arrived at the NSS, he wanted to stone, storm the NSS. Then I told him, don't waste your time. These people, they are nothing right now. Because if they were effective, you will not be here. All their intelligence is nil. Already you are here. They have no weapon, they have nothing. Just leave them alone. Let's go. And uh, when we arrived at the army headquarters, there was no one, only the guard. There was no officer. Only one sergeant, the guard commander and uh, his men. He came out. Was he armed at the time? Yes. Uh, who approached him first? I, because I was in front. Uh, what was the distance between you and the rest of the group? Uh, it was about 20, 30 meters, because this is a built-up area. And uh, did you have a conversation with this lone sergeant who was there guarding the establishment? Yes. And what did you discuss? I told him about the situation. He said that now he knows why there is no officer who reported on duties. What, if exactly, was no <coughs> what exactly did you tell him? <coughs> I've told him that uh, at this present moment, uh, we are moving to take, out this, uh, to take over the state house. Then uh, it's a coup in progress. Did you ask him to join? I do. But he but we asked him to stay and guard the guard the army headquarters. Before you left, did he assure you of his support? Yes, he did. And what happened after that? After that uh, it was just a stone throw to to the old Atlantic, not far away. They they were watching us. us. And I can fully remember that uh, it was uh, Corporal Sadi Khan, a form, he was a former gendarme, who was uh, on guard. Uh, at and that time, what was the old Atlantic used for? It was a residence for this, uh, one of the residents for the state guard. We have more of outriders living there. At that time, was that place stage for a defense as a defense position well tactically it's, it was not a good defensive position but they were defending their resident yeah. because their defense is just <laughs> for that portion it was a defense nonetheless yeah it was a defensive position yeah so you mentioned one person called Sadi Khan yes uh, uh, did you see him uh, when you approached that place? Yes, I approached him and I spoke to him. He told me that, uh, the guard, I asked him, who is the guard commander today? He said, it's Lai Baji. I told him to call Lai Baji. He shouted at Lai Baji, who was in. Lai Baji came. Lai Baji was a former field force turned to gendarme. And uh, I know him very well. We know each other because he was my drill instructor, one of my drill instructors. I spoke to Lai Baji, explained to him, he said, no, 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 they, they, they didn't agree. Then I told him, you, Lai, how can you defend here? What do you have? AK-47, one magazine? What else? Each AK-47, one magazine? At your armory, you know that I know what is there, there is nothing. Then I, uh, I told him the reinforcement that you were waiting from, uh, I forgot the name of the, the barrack, uh, but behind, uh, uh, behind MRC, I told him, did they come? He said, no. I told him they're here. He looked at them and saw his own people, his reinforcement. Then I spoke to him in Jola. They spoke, they spoke, they spoke, they opened the gate. We went in, and I told him to call uh, Lantombong. Then Lantombong was twice here to Kababajo. Kababajo was already 
on the, on the boat with the president. At that point in time, who was the most senior officer commanding State House? Lan Tombong, Tamba. Then when you went inside Old Atlantic with Yajami and others, um, uh, what happened? <coughs> I called Lan Tombong and he get, uh, passed me over the phone. Who called Lam Lang Tombo? Lai Baji, the guard commander. And who spoke to him first? I spoke to him first. And what did you say to him? I explained to him the situation, what happened, what is in progress. And uh, I show him that, well, he has no chance to put up a fight. One, he doesn't have the ammunition. Two, he doesn't have the men. Three, uh, he doesn't have the firepower. Uh, would and uh, you, would he is not expecting any friendly forces for rein reinforcement. He has no reinforcement coming in. And there is no means that the door cannot be a security for them because of the weapons that are with the insurgents. Just one RPG is enough to open the gate. So to save life and property, the best thing is for him just to join. And I told him, moreover, who are you defending? The state house or where is the president? Because already I knew the president was there. He said he left. I told him, if you want to lose your life, try. But we are coming. And if we come, I gave you five minutes to open the gate. If not, we will open it ourselves. Then uh, <coughs> Yaya asked me to talk to, he asked me the phone and Yaya spoke to him in Jola. Okay, before that, uh, you made an effort to convince Lang Tombong to join. Is that right? Yes. Okay, Yaya spoke to him in Jola. In Jola. what happened? I don't know what they said to each other. But whatever the case, we were going. When he finished talking, he said, okay, let's go. And, and uh, who took lead? It was always me. Then what happened? We went up to the uh, Marina Parade Gate. I knocked the small door. It, when it was opened, it was uh, ASP Sonko. Who did opened you, the gate? Did you know ASP Sonko before? Yes, he's my badge mate. In the genre, he's my and badge. At man. this stage, how did you wear your beret? Still, I left it as it was, uh, grey. Still conveying the impression that you are still TSG, correct? Yes. And uh, what did he say? Well, he said that he heard the conversation I had with uh, Lan Tombong. Tell him now, just open the main gate, let us get in, because you cannot stop us. He ordered uh, two of the sentries to open the gate. We opened the gate and we went in. The time that we are reaching the, uh, the state house guard room, the other gate, the other gate opened. That's uh, the gate uh, coming through Makati Square. Then Edward came in, and the others, then uh, I saw Sabali for the first time. I saw Sabali. I saw Sabali and uh, Haidara. And they came, we assembled the state guard, and they talked to them. Who and assembled I told them? I, what? Who ordered that they be assembled? Uh, it was uh, who, uh, Yaya who, uh, Lantomong, Yaya who told Lantomong to assemble everybody. And then uh, what happened after, after that? Well, there was a small talk of what happened and everything that, uh, every, nothing happened, no one was heard, no, no fly was heard, and then, uh, the change of government is taking place, but, uh, they had to time? fight corruption, and that was after one. After one p.m. Yeah, after one p.m. Who was the most senior officer present at the time? Me. 
I, sorry, I was the most senior officer present. And what happened after that after meeting that, you had? From there, I told Yaya and uh, Edu, or I told them, well, I gave you the state house and finish. Then I walked. On my way, I walked through, I went to the police headquarters. And what happened there? When I went to the police headquarters, just explaining to other officers what happened. Well, everybody was there, not doing anything. Then, uh, at the police of at the police headquarters, did mm -hmm. you see Chongan this time? Yes, I saw him. Did you have a conversation with him? Yes. And can, he can told me that tell uh, us about it? he told me when he saw that he couldn't do anything, he had to go through the mangroves, through the mangroves uh, to Tobacco Road. Came back. I, I met him uh, and uh, at uh, first I met him at the fire station, fire at the firehouse up. Oh. Would it surprise you that uh, Mr. Chongan has no recollection of this? <laughs> well, that's him. But uh, I have those recollections. Then we went to his office. We went to his office, and there were all the, se the other police, senior police officers. That's where Haidara and uh, Sana came. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. uh, could I ask the members of the public again to remain silent? Uh, this is the witness's testimony. It is the witness who is important here. Please, even if you have your own information about what he is about to say, don't say it. Please respect the commission enough to keep silent. Uh, thank you, Council. From this perspective here, not getting what's coming from the audience there. Is there some something? Yes, I could hear whispers of an answer, name being mentioned, and the witness adopted it. And it's not help, it's not good. Thank you very much. I'm uh, uh, very well taken. And the police audience, uh, please remain silent. Thank you. Continue. Uh, thank you, Mr. Witness. The microphone. Microphone. Uh, I want to get the sequence right. When you arrived at the police headquarters, where did you first see Chonga? At the firehouse. And from, do you recall what time of the day this was? It was uh, around two, around two after two. And. Uh, what happened after, during your meeting at the fire service? Uh, did you tell him what you did? Of course, I did. Did he say anything? Well, <laughs> he didn't believe. Uh, he couldn't believe uh, that it has happened so fast and because he said that he didn't trust the boys, on what they said. Uh, after that, <coughs> what happened? After that, we went to his office at the main police headquarters. Some officers came, police officers, I cannot recall them. That's where Sana Sabali and uh, Haidara came. And uh, Sana was very rude on uh, the way he was talking to people because he was to explain things at least, but he was uh, a bit rude. And uh, he had a little bit talk uh, altercation with Chongan. And what happened after that? Uh, then he left. From there, I bought a vehicle and, w and went home to Bacow. For me, I was 
done with it for that day. Did you attend State House again after that? Yes, I do. I when, did. when did you go there? No, no, sorry, before going to Bacau, sorry, before going to Bacau, I went to the State House. And what happened there? Uh, then uh, there is this uh, Dr. Yai. Yai, 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 what's his name again? Which service did he belong to, if any? To the army, to the army. I think he's Pachak. Oh. He was a medical doctor, Yai. Medical doctor, Yai Pachak from I, the I army. I think. Uh, That's what you said, right? I think his nickname was Pachak, so yeah. Uh -huh. And what happened there? Then uh, we're sitting in the main. Tell us who was present. There was Dr. Yai. What was his rank at the time? Commander. Major. Okay. Ross Yaya. Sadibu. Uh, Sana Sabali. Myself. I believe Mama Cham. What was the rank of Mama Cham at the time? Captain. I believe Kambi was there too, Captain Kambi. Uh, who else? What? Do you know Kambi's first name? I think it's, ba I believe it's Bakari. I believe, I'm not sure. I know it's... <laughs> but Captain Kambi here. Captain Kambi, yeah. From which service? From the army. Who else? No, the rest I cannot, I cannot catch. And what happened at this place? Well, we were just talking at one moment. Uh, Sana Sabali, Edward, and Yaya choose to retire in a room. They said they have something to discuss. Why Before, did they choose to retire to discuss amongst yeah, the three of them? Among the three of them. Was Sadibu Haidara involved? No. Sadibu, yes. Edward, no, Edward, Yaya, Sadibu, and uh, Sana. That would be four of them? Four of them, yeah. They retired. Why, was, why were the others excluded? <laughs> the others were not original. They are not original part of it. They were the four people. So they have something to discuss. <laughs> between four of them. What happened after that? I left for my home, back home. So before they finished their conversation, you left? I left. Before this time, before you left, did Yajame address the group that was present? The officers, not in my presence. Do you, did you hear any talk about who was going to take charge of the affairs of this country from that moment onwards? No. You left and you went home to Bacau. What happened after that? The next morning, around 7 o'clock, I went to the State House. That was Saturday morning. Was the State House your normal duty station? No, but seeing the circumstances, that's where I should go and know what's going on. Why not at the police headquarters? <coughs> well, that was my decision, to go to the State House to know what's going on. And what happened there? Then uh, we moved to the, there is a small, there used to be, I don't know now, a small hut by, uh, by the School of Nursing. It's 
small hut. We moved around there. Who moved there? Yeah, yeah. Edward, myself, then Sheriff Mai came, left Captain, uh, Chief Superintendent Sheriff Mai, left in Indoor, uh, Palm Bay, yeah, who else? Okay, I can, re I can rem uh, remember these people. So then we are looking for how strategizing how to consolidate the gains. What were the gains? The, the, state, the country is the gain. The state house and everything. That was the gain, how to consolidate it. And what did you decide? Mm. Well, as we were discussing different uh, scenarios, Sana came with his convoy, and uh, he came with uh, Sadi Haidara. He didn't know what people were talking about. He just came rushed and started shouting, people are walking and you are sitting here. I got mad and I insulted his mother. Then we each cock, all of us, we cock our rifles. We are ready to shoot each other. Edo grabbed him. Edo and uh, this. Edo and Sadi will grab him. Yeah, grab me. Because we were going to fight. Uh, so then uh, we made peace, talk, talk, talk. And at we settled it. At this stage, was a council set up? No. At this stage, was leadership defined? It was said, it was, yeah, because already it was announced. How about members of the council? Were they already announced? Uh, no, I cannot recall that. But I know it's that day that uh, Major Jiba and Lieutenant Yanko Baturi came. In that morning, they came and met us there. At this stage, uh, were the powers of Sana Sabali already cemented? Was he, at this stage, regarded as the tough guy he ultimately beca became? I would say yes, because the way he rushed and with siren and so on, I think it was cemented since uh, the day before when they started this thing. I believe so. So what happened afterwards? Well, afterwards, uh, I was the, given the role of uh, provo marshal. That uh, is a... Uh, what is provost? The military oh, police. Okay. I was given the role of military police to, uh, to control the soldiers so that they would not do any excess to police them. In the fact, you are policing the security yes. arrangements that were in place. Yes. And those security arrangements were put in place to consolidate the gains, correct? Yes. Uh, so, in a sense, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. uh, in a sense your responsibility was to further strengthen what was already achieved. Yes. Uh, which was at this stage an overthrow of the constitutional order. Yes. Uh, and what happened after that? Well, life when uh, smooth arrested some uh, young officers, you know, some police, uh, to some army officers who were stealing fuel at the cell station, others were going to gas stations, you know, just bringing a vehicle, putting it full of gas without paying, you know, and those small, <laughs> small things. Well, uh, at one point, uh, we had some Grenades that I had to explode in two yearing. Somebody threw out the grenades. I don't know, he was running or something. It fell down. 
you know, those nothing nothing major happened luckily during that period. Would you say that the role of Provost Marshal at this period was a critical position? Yes. Well, he, he was to see that uh, the discipline of the soldiers are maintained. And what happened subsequently to you? Well, subsequently, when they built up, uh, when they built up their cabinet and uh, others, I went back to Fajara Barracks. Were you given the position you were promised? I I didn't ask for any position, and I rejected. I rejected it at the bridge. I told you I don't want any position. Really, I don't want any cabinet position. I don't want it. That was not uh, why I was joining them. Okay, so um, uh, you went back to the barracks. Yes. They formed their cabinet. Mm -hmm. What happened after that? Uh, Later, around August 18, I was called at the State House and given a letter that I'm appointed Commissioner Nordba. Did you accept that position? Yes. Did you deploy to North Bank as Commissioner? Yes, sir. And uh, for how long have you served at commi as Commissioner? Mm, almost two years. Uh, by June 96, I was relieved as Commissioner. Would you consider your appointment as Commissioner as a reward? No. No. What would you consider it to be? Well, because they told me personally that uh, he heard that the Baribus are the most difficult, the Baribus are the most difficult people to deal with. He said, no, I'm saying what he said, to deal with. And he trusts me to take care of that area. Yes, that's... that's he, he needed a man he could trust yes. to handle the body bunkers. That's what you're telling us. Yes. Commissioner Kinte would not take kindly to that. <laughs> but anyway, and uh, so you stayed at, at, uh, at North Bank for two years. Almost. And what happened after that? Well, after a small altercation, I was uh, removed and uh, redeployed in the army. What was the reason for your redeployment? Well, I cannot say fully that, but I know that at one time in Karawan, at a meeting, he asked me to promise things for them. I told him I'm not doing it. If he wants to promise, let him come and promise. But who who asked you to promise something? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, who? Yeah, Jamie, the president. Was he president at the time? Or uh, he was, was chairman. What was it he wanted you to promise? Okay, so I think it was about the extension of the electric system in Caravan. So as I, I was the commissioner. There was no vote on it, and there was nothing on it. And uh, previously, before even leaving, he said that we shouldn't promise people anything. So why should I promise? And I didn't see any way to deliver it. If he want to promise, let him come. He's, he's coming to talk after me. Let him do the, the promise, not me. I'm well, not doing it. So, and you were removed. I think uh, that's one of the that's one of the things. That's why I was removed because. Were you redeployed somewhere? Well, uh, I was redeployed to the army. Uh, as what? As a major. Then uh, a week later, I was redeployed from the, to the police again to form up the PIU. What happened after that? Well, after the PIU, 
I was uh, deployed at the at the dog squad, at the command of the dog squad. Then uh, on October, I think 1999, by executive orders, I was dismissed. Was that the end of it for you in the service of the country? Officially, yes. You were never reinstated? No. Let's try to recap what mm -hmm. happened mm -hmm. between in July 22nd, 1994. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You received your orders to sit and kill. Mm -hmm. You went to the bridge. Mm -hmm. You modified those orders. You negotiated with Jame and his followers. Mm -hmm. You agreed to join them. Mm -hmm. Correct? Yes. Reinforcement was sent from Bakau. Mm -hmm. You convinced them to no, join. No, uh, reinforcement for the presidential guard. Let's make it a little bit different. Yes, that's what I meant. Mm -hmm. Reinforcement for the presidential guard. Mm -hmm. Came forward, you convinced them to join. You convinced your own group mm -hmm. to join. Mm -hmm. You convinced all the people in set in the ambush to join. Mm -hmm. Confirmed by saying yes or no. Yes. Uh, you convinced the last defense, Bineminte, Lieutenant Bineminte and his group to join, correct? Yes. You also convinced the lone guard you found at military headquarters to join, correct? Yes. You also convinced the state guards at Atlantic Road, at, uh, sorry, at Old Atlantic Hotel to join, correct? Yes. You encouraged Langtombong Tamba to give up state house and join, correct? Yes. And uh, the officer you found at the small door at State House, you convinced him to join, correct? Yes. You convinced them to open the gates, correct? Yes. No further questions? Mr. Chairman, I have no further questions. Thank you. Sorry, were you looking at me? I wasn't sure. But, uh, yeah. um, splendid. Thank you so much, Emma Council, for that. Do the commissioners have any questions to ask the witness? Yes, I'm uh, Commissioner Carr. Thank you. Um, in your statement on page 10, you mentioned that one of the causes of the coup was loss of confidence in the government. Was that both in the military and the general population? Or well, uh, let's talk a little bit on the political situation. You, know, if I don't know if you can recall, but uh, at one time President Jawara said that he was going to step down. And some accepted orders did not in the, within the PVP. And uh, we, I, I may be wrong, but there was a sense that uh, the PVP was split. You have the BB Dabo camp, the OJ camp, and the Sehu Sabali camp. Those were all enough, maybe, can correct me if I'm wrong. And uh, that has created. Uh, I won't say instability as such, but loss of confidence of that uh, between that pull and push, and it has uh, it has facilitated. It's one of the things that facilitated all this coup and so on.
Thank you very much. If there are no further questions, Council, is that the end of um, uh, the witnesses' appearance? Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Chairman. In the, in the absence of any further questions, perhaps you can thank the witness on behalf of the Commission. Okay, if there are no further questions, uh, Mr. Suare, thank you so much. Uh, so sorry to have taken so much of your time to come here, but we are been charged um, by the National Assembly to create um, the truth. Oh, sorry, come to create some other situation that uh, uh, would um, uh, bring out the truth on what really happened. You have contributed um, uh, to that, and we thank you enormously for your uh, appearance um, before the Commission. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, sir. It was an honor to tell uh, the people what has transpired. Thank you. Um, if there are no further uh, issues coming from the council. Uh, the meeting was, is adjourned, and we meet tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. Thank you so much. Meeting is adjourned.